Ronnie Duggar, who joins Thorn Dryer on another edition of Rag Radio. <laughs> Today's show is being uh, videotaped by Grace Alfar of Z Graphics, and uh, Alan Pogue is here uh, doing still photography. Tracy Schultz is my uh, engineer. Tracy, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing well, thanks. Happy to be here. Well, it's always fun to have you here. Uh, and my guest today is going to be, oh man, this is an honor, uh, and it's going to be wonderful. Uh, Ronnie Duggar, uh, old friend uh, and a... Uh, as Brad Buchholz of the Austin American Statesman said, the godfather of progressive journalism in Texas. Uh, Ronnie Duggar was the founding editor of the Texas Observer. Uh, he uh, was born in Chicago, educated in San Antonio, and at, the U at UT Austin in Oxford, was the founding editor of the Texas Observer from 1954 to 1961, and later served as the Observer's publisher, spending more than 40 years with the crusading Texas tabloid. Uh, in 1966, he proposed and co-founded the Alliance for Democracy, a national grassroots anti-big corporate organization. Ronnie Duggar has written for hundreds of publications. He's taught all over the place. Uh, he's had uh, fellowships from the Rockefeller Foundation, the National Endowment for Humanities, and so on and so on. He won the 2011 George Polk Award for his career in journalism. Ronnie Duggar, do we have a chance to win now? Boy. No, not now. What do you think about what's going on now? Has Citizens United put us in a position where we're... Well... I know you... I think uh, both political parties have descended pretty low. The Republican Party, which used to have honorable conservatives of conspicuous power in it, seems to me has turned into a military phalanx to uh, destroy government except for war, police, and enriching the rich. You just don't want any government for anything but that. And, uh, and to commit wars around the world whenever we please, uh, whereas the Democratic Party seems to have been potted out, I guess by the power of money that has now become uncontrollable, uh, so that we're in a, in a vacuum situation. Well, it, be, it begins to be comparable in my mind to the, Vi the Weimar Republic. And uh, you get the Tea Party people coming along, getting immediately bought over uh, by uh, the Koch brothers, whereas that kind of indignation against the policies of the federal government could just as easily have gone toward progressives. Now you've got the Occupy movement on the left, and we're going into a kind of a chaotic situation, which is very dangerous. Uh, I believe we're headed, well, okay, so long comes the Supreme Court and becomes a five-person dictatorship, yeah. uh, prohibiting, uh, uh, rather, well, first prohibiting the election of Albert Gore as president, but beyond that, uh, opening corporate money vaults, huge, uh, we're talking Exxon, we're, talk, we're talking General Electric, we're talking all the banks, uh, they can spend any amount of money for any candidate they want to because they're persons. Corporate personhood, long history of absolute scandalous evolution into the idea that corporations have the full rights of citizens. So they're, corporations are persons and citizens united. In other words, I don't think the country can last five or 10 years. With, corp with open corporate vaults pouring into every election they choose. Now, now, you can still win some elections when you don't have as much money as your opponent, but 10 years? I don't know. I don't think so. So what's happening is we're in great danger of, it seems to me you can look at it imaginatively two ways, although I'm just talking uh, in the ideas that are forming in my mind now. One day, used to, we used to have a guy at the Observer named Charles Ramsdell. He went down to Mexico a lot, and he knew a lot about Mexico. Good writer from San Antonio. He used to call Mexico an imitation democracy. That's what we are now. We're now an imitation democracy governed by a corporate oligarchy in league with the billionaires and a bought Congress. I think the Congress, with honorable exceptions, is now a whorehouse. Pardon me, can I say that on nonprofit television? You can say television? whorehouse. You can say it again if you want to. All right. So you've got a whorehouse Congress. You've got presidents chosen by open corporate money vaults. And the other way you can look at it is that we're headed toward fascism. 
Now, it can continue all the appearances of being a democracy. We'll continue to have elections, which, as I'm happy to have a heavy hand in establishing, can now be stolen by counting them in computers. Uh, and they, you, that was an issue that you've dealt with a lot. That you Since were, 1988 in The New Yorker. But they haven't, the Congress has not passed a bill yet because both Democrats and Republicans uh, are elected by the same system. And you don't fix a system like you don't fix the money, uh, corporate money in politics in the system which elected most of the members. Well, in other words, an, uh, the Supreme Court is now a five to four partisan dictator. Uh, we're in, a, we're, in a policy, we're in a period where we use drones to attack people all over the world. As soon as other nations get drones, I guess we're going to have people picked off in the United States. What are we going to say to the nations that do it? We got nuclear weapons that we're now. I believe I, I believe in this situation. You've got two levels when you have to think. You have to think immediately, and in my opinion, you can be for Obama on the grounds that Romney would be much worse if that happens to configure with the, with with your values. And I think, well, in other words, that seems to me to be a reasonable way to think. But uh, with climate change coming and nuclear war increasing uh, as a likelihood as more and more nations get the bombs. At Mr. Obama has taken the position that we should not build a new plutonium factory at the Los Alamos lab for three and a half to five billion dollars uh, because we don't need, well, he's taken the position he wants to suspend, the, but the Senate on, on uh, May the 24th just passed a, a, a renewal of a new plutonium factory for the United States. Whereas Obama's position is we, we must move toward a nation without nuclear weapons, and yet uh, we're not doing it. So uh, in that situation, uh, I don't know what we do. I was just thinking this morning, uh, it might be that we need to get through this election minimizing disasters like we have uh, several elections. Uh, but maybe after that, we should take some deep breaths and start thinking about a social democratic party in the United States that isn't afraid of the word socialism, that is willing to go into a much more active program of public ownership, that will not be segued or, fin or finessed out of facing corporate power, in other words, following the European model. Now, the question is, and I don't, I'm not an optimist, but I think you have to continue to try, is American politics now so dominated by the rot gut imagery that has been uh, promulgated? I, I, I'll always remember George Bush the first uh, running his presidency about the the, the, how horrible the L word is, the liberal, the word liberal. I mean, well, that was just a sort of a symbol of what's been, happened to whole political discourse. I mean, for Obama, who is saving the healthcare industry's existence with his health care, to be called a socialist. Well, in other words, no. is, it, is that debasement of, uh, of language into abusive and frightening uh, implications? Uh, what dominates American politics now, or can it be a rational discussion again? Okay, well, the, we... And I'm, I'm not sure which. It's all moved. I mean, everything, the, the, the center has moved so far to the right uh, that, you know, Obama would be a moderate Republican <laughs> not very long ago. Uh, yeah. and, and, I mean, your idea that, that I think a lot of people have thought about of, of some kind of a... Of a of, a, of another party. Well, another party, uh, how would we uh, another get there? party is the wrong way to think about or of, it. Or of a, of a presence. Perhaps a yeah, lot of it would be externally, it would be outside the political I mean, system. I don't I know. I don't, I'm not an optimist about it. I just think we have to keep trying. And I'm not uh, arguing a third party. I, I was for Nader okay. and I regret it. Okay, yeah. Uh, and, uh, I mean, Nader went in and campaigned in Florida and, and in my opinion, uh, tilted it to yeah. where they could steal it for... Uh, Bush, well, number two. I, I don't have any answers, but I think we ought to realize that we're in a very deep hole and may not get out, that there, our country may be ending as a free and a good place. There's a lot of people who believe that what we have to do is start building institutions, cooperatives, uh, and uh, you know, a, a, a sort of a, a structure below the... Al Perovitz is a wonderful yeah. advocate of this, and uh, he is arguing that we need a larger public sector, not so large as to, as to jeopardize liberties, like they did in the communist countries, 
But he, in a piece, Not So Wild a Dream, in The Nation, which I recommend to you for June 11th of this year, Alperovitz has one in a series of pieces saying we need, uh, we need in some sectors, we need more public, public uh, ownership. Uh, and uh, in that connection, it's, let me give you an example of how it gets lost. John Kenneth Galbraith advocated democratic socialism for the United States, but only in one book in the 70s. And it was a, it's, a, it's a passage in this book, it's maybe eight or 10 pages, uh, very similar to what Alperovitz has in the nation that's currently on the stand. Furthermore, uh, both of them turn to Europe for all the, all the models you can, exp I mean, my heavens. And uh, you remember Adley Stevenson ran for president. He had a son who was a senator named Adley Stevenson. Adley Stevenson advocated a public oil company. We got all this oil. Why don't we produce it ourselves and find out how much it costs to produce it? Then you can compare it to what you're, you're having to pay at the pump. Uh, yardstick corporations, they're called. Uh, plenty of democratic nations have percentages for example, of their airlines. Well, then the the public airline, if it's uh, they don't get tax advantages, if they if they're better than the pub, than the private airlines, the pro private airlines have to get better. What's actually happened, if I may say so, is the whole theme of free enterprise has been replaced as a, as a, the reality by what I think of as the second system, which is essentially gigantic corporations that are not that are transnational. And the only way to make the first, if you can't get the banks, the big banks too big to fail to break down, as our pair of it says, then the logic is the co the country should take them over, and, and because then you can go back to a competitive banking system. But the public sector has been so demonized. I know it has. That's what I'm asking. Yeah. Have we have we gotten so propagandized that we can't think anymore in our own interest? Yeah. Certainly, in my humble opinion. Uh, the Tea Party people have. What they're doing is arguing for corporate control of the United States instead of arguing for yeah. a free country. And of course, the, I guess the Occupy movement was an attempt to, to change that, change the dialogue, change the conversation. It's why it's hard not to be, it's why it's hard to be an optimist. Uh, there's, there's, they have a doctrine of horizontal democracy. That is, they don't want leaders. I mean, this is a very powerful strain. And when Graeber was here in town, that was a part of what he was saying. Well, that, that's true, but you've you got to have thinkers. Then you've got to have some way of winnowing the better ideas from the less good ideas. Uh, you've got to have leaders. Uh, the, the problem is we get sold out by so many bought-out leaders that there's a radical reaction against what I'd have to call rational organization. We, we follow leaders. And if we don't have a leader, well, they certainly have plenty of leaders. They call them CEOs and billionaires. Well, so we got to, it's like having to start in the dark, but we have to start fighting again. Okay. I'm Thorne Dreyer. This is RAG Radio. My guest is uh, Ronnie Duggar, uh, founding editor of the Texas Observer. We'll be right back. David McBride, who is in Berlin and who listens to us every week, he said, uh, greetings to Ronnie Duggar from an Austinite in Germany. He said, he said, why don't you ask, ask him if he would tell some Texas Observer tales about courageous journalism in Texas and the fights about the oil depletion allowance and the role of the Texas Railroad Commission. And he said that he also remembers that the Daily Texan once ran a blank front page to protest the censorship of a report on the oil depletion allowance. Uh, that was an exciting issue. It might not sound that exciting to folks like this thing, but... Well, actually, that was Willie Morris. Willie was... Was the, that Willie? Okay. Willie was the editor of the Daily Texan, and he was raising... Oh, that, it was game. Willie Morris who did that, yes. Yeah, he was yeah. the editor, and, yeah. and uh, you know, I needed an associate editor, and when he graduated, I hired him, because right. it was... But it wasn't uh, on the front page. It was on the editorial page, and they had put censors over him, uh, right. uh, the regents had. Uh, the Texas Board of Student Publications at least temporarily had. So when they wouldn't let him run this editorial, he just ran a blank space, which uh, is why I thought, hey, I better hire him over here. <laughs> what was the issue about the oil depletion allowance? There wasn't any particular issue. I, I was just writing editorials about it um, against the oil depletion allowance. And um, I, it's a complicated story, but it, okay. it cost me personally, like these things tend to. Yeah. Uh, I didn't get, I was the... Uh, University's nominee for the Rhodes Scholarship one year, and I got to the uh, two judges who were in the regional judge, and it was a particular professor of law who hated my guts because of the editorials <laughs> on oil depletion allowance, and that's all we talked about. So I had to get to Oxford some other way. 
Uh, and you got there. Yeah. I think Willie Morris went there. Thanks to the Austin too. Rotary Club, which really? sent me there. Really? I got back, though. I made a speech to the Austin Rotary Club, about 1,000 people there. And I got a standing ovation, except from the doctors present, who passed a resolution that the Rotary Club should stop sending students abroad and coming back infected with foreign ideologies. <laughs> <laughs> Forget I was for National Health Insurance. <laughs> you were for National Health Insurance way back when. Oh, yeah, about 51, 52. Right. Uh, Willie Morris wrote in North Towards Home, he said, When I had been in my third year at the university in 1955, the year the paper started, I recall Ronnie Duggar, then 24 years old, sitting in a small dark office in the old frame building on West 24th Street in Austin, surrounded by newspapers and magazines. He said, Bramer, Billy Lee Bramer, his associate was out getting drunk with the lieutenant governor, and Duggar was writing the whole paper by himself in less than 24 hours. Uh, He said, once an issue was put to bed, he would take out... For somewhere in a woebegone 1948 Chevrolet, crowded with camping equipment, six-packs, notebooks, galley proofs, old loaves of bread, and sardine cans. Um, I, <laughs> what a good write. What an image. Uh, I think you actually just, I think when you finally left The Observer, uh, or maybe left as an editor, it seems like that he wrote that you just, that you took off to go camping and stayed for a while. I well, think, uh, you went off to the I figured out when I, I was there eight years, and uh, because I wasn't home with my family too much. Uh, it looks like about four hours a night. Uh, I've counted how many hours I was working, 120 hours, and they're 168 in a, in a week. I don't know if anybody knew that there were 168 hours. Well, I think I lost my thyroid for it. I, I would have I died in my 40s if a smart doctor hadn't figured out that I had thyroid. Uh, it stopped putting out thyroid, but then for two cents a day, I was able to survive. It was, it was, it was remarkable. The observer was... was an amazing phenomenon, and it, I mean, it was it was put together, you know, like, I mean, I don't know that it was always put together by you in 24 hours writing everything, but I mean, you did, oh, no, or the editor not. really oh, always did, the editor oh, yeah. did an awful lot of work oh, and yeah. wrote an awful I, lot of it. I, actually, what happened, uh, I started alone on the editorial side, and we had one business person, Del Sackett, and I was putting it out alone for, I guess, maybe a year or half a year or something like that, and Billy Lee Brammer whose novel, The Gay Place, is one of the best novels ever written by anybody in Texas, I think. Uh, Catherine Ann Porter and maybe some others, although I haven't read enough of those novels to say reliably. But one night, I, was, I, I would have a long row of all the Texas newspapers stacked by days, and, and uh, Billy Lee came in, though he was on the staff of the Austin American Statesman, and started clipping the papers for me. And, of course, we'd have a little beer and talk. And then he quit the paper, and he was the first associate editor. Uh, the, it was he his the novel the gay place which was actually a trilogy of, of it was, it was about novels. governor fenstermaker about governor fenstermaker but it was actually linden and and he <laughs> prayed, i mean it was this incredible i mean it was a it's a great book it, that one now is in my hand here yeah. uh david halberstam said there are two classic american political novels one is all the king's men by robert penn warren and the other is the gay place uh and his it was interesting because he 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 kind of he was in awe and in some ways loved Lyndon Johnson, mm-hmm. although he, this, the picture he painted of him, it was, you know, as opposed to Willie Morris, who was just talking about, who was sort of elegant erudite. Uh, I mean, <laughs> Billy Lee Bramer was really gon- kind of well, a gonzo a, journalist in his own way. There's a picture, there's a scene in, in, the, that, in The Gay Place where Governor Fenstermaker's in bed with his arms around two women, one on each side of him. And that, of course... Uh, reflects uh, scandalously on President uh, Johnson. And furthermore, there was this crusading editor of a liberal paper in Texas who used to go out and bed down with an English teacher in West Texas. And I asked uh, uh, Billy Lee one time. Willie England. Was was Willie the name, that was the term he used, and we, <laughs> well, we thought I, it was a composite of Willie Morris and, and Ronnie Duggar. Well, I asked perhaps. him. I asked, did did you say that I that the person who looks like me went out to West Texas and was making love with this English teacher? And he says. No, of course not. I wouldn't put you in my book. You're too inscrutable. <laughs> <laughs> too inscrutable. I realize it's absolutely stupid. He didn't story, figure he could scrut you. Uh, scru- <laughs> no, scrutable you. Scru- yeah. I don't know. Unscrutable. Uh, unscrutable. Been, yeah. yeah, inscrutable. Um, okay, so his the I- irony is that he writes this book that paints this incredibly larger than life picture of a larger than life character in the, to start out with, Lyndon Johnson. And then Lyndon. He, even though he kind of loved in a lot of ways Lyndon and, and admired him greatly, I think, 
uh, even though Lyndon was, was of course, a, a, a on company. the one hand, a charmer, and on the other hand, a giant That's, bully, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> you know, and, and yeah. an incredible manip manipulator. Uh, Johnson I hated say it. Was larger than life. I'd say included everything in yeah. life. Okay, uh, it was encompassed life. Yeah. Johnson hated the book and, yeah, and wouldn't let wouldn't have that's, anything to do with Billy right. Lee afterwards. And Billy Lee was just crushed. That's right. About I didn't this. know he was crushed. I, he was absolutely crushed. Well, and a lot of people thought it led was one of the things that led to his downfall because he had wanted to write. Well, he didn't have a downfall exactly. Well, he, he died of an overdose. Yes. Uh, but he, he died of an overdose that was ex, kind of an extended overdose. Over and furthermore, it wasn't fair to Johnson because the last time I saw uh, Billy Lee, I had to go see him in some house on West 29th Street. And it was early in the morning, about 9 o'clock. And he came out of the bedroom. And then a, a young lady came out of the bedroom in a sort of deshabille. And about five minutes later, a second young lady came out. <laughs> so maybe his imagination was fed by his own life. <laughs> I wouldn't call that uh, coming apart. I'd say that you know he just well he he, did, he had what he had terminal writer's block too. I think was one of the did problems. It? Yes, he I don't know. I didn't know that either. Uh, uh, there are people in Austin who know though. We'll yeah. talk about that later if you want yeah. to get them on. I mean Sydney's here. Yes, I his, his daughter and, yeah. and uh, we did a show and, with uh, Sydney and Nadine. Did yeah. he already? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, she. I mean Lyndon Johnson. Kind of, and the irony that I was going to bring up about that is that you, on the other hand, turned down Lyndon's, and, and I want you to yeah. talk about this next, his sort yeah. of proposed quid pro quo uh, for the Observer. I think he said, well, the Observer has, how many, how big a circulation do you have? And you said 6,000. And he said, well, you want to make it 60,000? Stick with me. And stick I'm, with and we'll me. Make it six, and 60, and I'll take you there. And, and you basically said no. And I want you to tell us about that incident. Cause, but, and, and on the other hand, you ended up having continual... Uh, interaction with him and wrote his wrote a biography of Johnson. So tell me about how that happened. Well, the reason I wrote it finally was because the editor asked me 50 years later to write about that relationship. And I, the reason I hadn't written it is because it's sort of self-serving and I don't, you know, but Johnson was trying to bribe me. Uh, basically, you, 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 I'm getting ready to run for president. You need to back me. Uh, you're trouble for me when the journalists come in from the Northeast. Uh, Sing my praises, and we'll we'll make the observer a wham dinger. Well, that's just a dime away from a bribe. But I didn't want to offend him. I, I was very I was very shy in person, and uh, I'm not shy, but I mean I was polite. Right. So I just needed to get away from there. We were out at the ranch, and uh, he said, "No, no, uh, stay for dinner. Uh, Bird will have plenty." So I was trapped, and. Uh, I stayed for dinner, and there was Bird, and there was uh, the managing editor of the Brackenridge Times in San Antonio, a high school paper when I was editor of it, Mary Margaret Wiley, and he, and, uh, and me. And uh, neither one of them said a word all night, I don't think. But there I was in a position where I had, uh, he, he, and Johnson said his theory of what a young journalist like, uh, a reporter like me ought to, like me, like I, like me, ought to do. Uh, Don't ask me. I'm always getting corrected. I'm <laughs> well, I'll ask I. Uh, okay. uh, anyhow. <laughs> there you go. Uh, is that the you eyes to, have it. You ought to pick out who you want to be president, and then you and then you make book with him and, and go all out for him as a journalist. Well, I, of course, he didn't believe that. He knew better than that. That's just the way he sucked a number of journalists in to write pieces about him, for example, in the Saturday Evening Post about why he should be president. And so I had to argue as though I believed he believed what he said he believed, and uh, of course we didn't get anywhere. And by the time uh, I got away that night, we were at the ran a, lo a low ranch out in front of his house, and you know maybe up to the knees or just a little above the knees. It was a very low uh, fence, I mean a low fence. And he was leaning at me so much that I remember I had to move back a step or two <laughs> uh, to uh, avoid contact. Yeah, you said he would put he put that we would put that long face right in your <laughs> that's right. yours. That's, that's, right. <laughs> that's what yeah. And he was very and his hands and when the were, observer ran that story, he was about, very hands on too, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. Uh, when the observer ran that story about about it, they had a photograph of uh, with it of Johnson leaning over Abe Fortas, and Fortas was literally leaning back like a a, a bow. <laughs> 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 that was the way you had to do with Johnson. He was something else. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I one of the things I think that that led to all of this was that you, the Observer was on the 
the other side of a major split within the Democratic Party, or sure. there was an insurgency within the Democratic Party. And what Party. Johnson was doing was siding with the conservatives because we, we weren't going to take orders from Rayburn and Johnson like the Democratic Party did in Texas. And therefore, he started calling us the Red Hots. And that's why I got, uh, I got crosswise with him right away. Now, that's kind of ironic when it turns out he, he turns out to be the best uh, liberal policy president since Roosevelt. But the fact is, in, in that context, he was fighting for Price Daniel and the segregationists. And hell, he appointed, excuse me, heck, he appointed uh, Ben Ramsey, the, uh, I mean, he got Ben Ramsey appointed, the Democratic National Committee from Texas. And Ramsey was a, I, I won't say Ramsey was corrupt, I don't know, but he was certainly the godfather of corruption in the Texas Senate, which he presided over. So we had to fight him. We had to. Well, and, and, and he was one an example because he was an er, you know early on he was like such a mixed signal. It seemed like I mean Absolutely. he was always a supporter of civil rights, but he was also an ultimate well, Machiavell he, Machiavellian. Well, he voted again. He wasn't always a supporter of civil rights in well, the forties. Yeah. He voted for the anti lynch. He vo he voted against the bill to prohibit lynching Negroes in the South, like they were called at that time. Yeah, well, wasn't a whole lot. I mean, didn't he, he was always so calculating? He, it seemed yeah, like sure. everything yeah, was calculation, sure. but. I think deep down he was, I mean, when he, you know, uh, said in a speech that we, we should overcome, I think deep down he was deeply satisfied to help help Hispanics and blacks. He was, that was that's who he was. But I think it was um, Cameron who said at one point, he always put his ambition first. Well, I don't know about always, but certainly he was driven to be president. It was a dangerous and uh, incorrectable obsession. Yeah, and, and it, therefore, I think, I mean, he would, he would, do almost anything uh, to sound like whoever he was talking to, yeah. that he was on his side. And then he was brought down by Vietnam. Um, and Definitely. And how much was he, how much did he struggle with all of that? Uh, did it, did he just seem, that was the path just obvious to him or did, I was he know. really? Uh, uh, I did a lot of interviewing of him in the White House and he'd walk up and down and uh, it, one thing is, he, he saw it as a contest between Ho Chi Minh and himself, and it was a macho thing. And another thing that's in my memory... I, Quien is mas macho? Uh, no, yeah. let me say that he okay. talked about, we'll make him. He used the verb make him. we got to make him do this, make him do that, in other words, force. Uh, also, when he was walking up and down, okay, was he worrying about the 2 million Vietnamese who were dying or the 58,000 Americans? Well, yes. I guess, but what he talked about was my boys. He was talking about the pilots doing the bombing. He wanted to be sure they'd get back. No, I'd say he was a very old-fashioned president. His job was to win the war and not imagine the opposition dying. Just not, just sort of block that out. Oh, sure. Just that's what presidents well, are supposed to do, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. They're supposed to be nationally loyal and uh, to heck with the rest of the world. Well, that's the way he was, uh, in my impression. The to jump back to the to observer into those days, yeah, there were sure. so many incredible characters, characters, personalities, figures involved. <laughs> Still in, are they got in a the bunch observer. Of characters left, I think. I'm Tell me about so. Frankie Randolph. Well, all right, Mrs. Uh, Randolph. Well, she was one of four heirs of the Kirby lumber fortune. One day, uh, I wasn't there, but this is what is part of the story of Mrs. Randolph, 1956. 56, yeah. 52, she walked into the Harris County Democratic Party office and laid down a $1,000 check and said, put me to work. And she went to work on the precincts. She believed that the way to help the country and, and move it left and toward welfare, welfare programs and helping the poor, that you needed to organize the precincts, especially the precincts in the minority areas, but all the precincts, have precinct chairs, and then form the Harris County Democrats and take Houston, and what she did. And furthermore, in imitation and admiration of her, they did the same thing in San Antonio, and they were trying to in Dallas and Fort Worth. That's what was challenging Johnson's control of the national impression of his control of Texas. Well, was Ms. creating a, a, a grassroots footprint. The idea was uh, populism in political organization. Right. And Ms. Randolph was a radical, a liberal. Uh, she was, I don't know where, where she got her ideas, but uh, 
and she made the bargain with me, just like the other people did uh, in Austin in 1954, that I'd have absolute control. I told her she fired me once because she got so mad. We liked, we both drank very high quality scotch when I called on her in, uh, in Houston. Uh, she was a fine woman. She, uh, they did not have a pretentious house, though they were multimillionaires, I guess. I never knew how much money they had, but they had this low, quiet house in uh, better sections, but not a big, you know, not a big Turtle Creek kind of house like they have in Dallas. And she was a very quiet and modest person. And uh, people, finally politicians got to where they were coming to her for support. And she would try to figure out whether, as she said, they were our alligator or theirs. <laughs> That's the way she looked at politics. And, well, she was, a, she was a great influence. And then to Billy Carr, who was her protege, I guess. Yeah, was, it were, was all about alligators. But actually, Billy Carr Woodrow talked. Seals was, too. And Woodrow Seals. And uh, Woodrow wound up to be the federal judge, from Ms. Randolph yeah. to Ralph Yarbrough to the federal judge, who ruled that the children of illegal aliens get to go to school free in the United States. That's the kind of, and, and William Wayne Justice was also, in my, the way I look at it, she was, Ms. he was Ms. Randolph's judge, the guy who, you know, one of the most right. progressive judges on integration and everything else who ever served out of Thailand. Right. So she had a terrific effect. Right, and and, and, uh, and and Lower, who I knew, was the one who took on the the real yeah. thing, grassroots organizing. Yeah, but uh, I that she had, I felt about her that I had a second mother. Yeah, uh, and in a way, Eckhart was my second father. Okay, uh, I'm Thorne Dreyer. This is Rag Radio. My guest is Ronnie Duggar, uh, crusading journalist, the fo- uh, founding editor of the uh, of the legendary Texas Observer. We'll be right back. As I went walking, I saw. A Neil Young, Crazy Horse, brand new. That's right. This land is your land. Very fine. Uh, Ronnie Duggar is my guest on RAG Radio. I'm Thorne Dreyer. Uh, We want to talk about what's going on now and how you view it. Uh, First, very quickly, why don't you tell us about... The the Observer had this incredible... I mean, it has created... I mean, people who've edited and worked for The Observer, there's just a, a rogues gallery of wonderful... Uh, journalist. I wonder if you repair that metaphor. <laughs> repair that metaphor. <laughs> uh, uh, Molly Ivins and Kay Northcott, of course, were a, an editorial tandem, and, and I think, as Bill Minot- Minotaglio said, wrote that you're probably the only, you know, two woman editorial leadership team in the country. At I the thought time. so. I, I, I couldn't think of anybody else yeah. who had two women running the and, paper, but now Mother Jones does. And and I mean, and Molly Ivins was yeah. like, you know. I don't know how tall she was. Eight and a half feet or something. Eight and a half feet tall, and, and Kay Northcott was about four and a half. Well, so no, she's about five, just, five, five, t- five well, six, seven. But yeah, but anyway, they contrast, were just wonderful, yeah. and they were such a contrast because Molly was so. <laughs> Tell me about that first meeting with Molly Ivins, your, your interview with her. I don't remember it. I don't remember it. Uh, but uh, uh, it was, she was, there were two, there, we had 30 or 40 applicants for editor every time, and there was Billy Porterfield uh, and Molly Ivins were, in my opinion, about, equal. Uh, Billy uh, was a wonderful writer, but in the, when I interviewed him, he said he didn't like politics. Well, that's all right. I don't either, but if you don't like politics, it might affect what kind of an editor you are. And uh, Molly was at least equally as qualified, and she had all these fine reports, front page stuff out of the Minneapolis Star. So uh, 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 Kay agreed to become co-editor. Right. And so we had the first all-woman editing paper, I hope, at least that I know of, yeah. at that time in the country. And you thought that she had more political she uh, was just, grounding than Porterfield, who was more kind of maybe cultural. Porterf- p- cultural, but also, uh, also uh, uh, Molly didn't have a reputation, which she, of course, earned as a writer then. She was yeah. a reporter, a good, tough, uh, liberal reporter who was, was exactly right for the Observer model that was developing. And Porterfield wasn't quite right. He was more a writer. And, uh, and a course, wonderful writer. And Billy Lee Brammer wasn't a writer when he came on. He was right. a reporter. He hadn't written anything like that. So uh, I, so finally I went with, went, went with Molly. There was a wonderful exchange, and I don't, I had it here, but I, where uh, you said, when, when are you going to quit being funny? Well, I didn't. Of course, funny. of course, when I appointed an editor, they were in complete charge. Right. And so I wasn't going around criticizing them or saying, I don't agree with that, or you should have written it this way. 
So I never said anything to Molly. God, she was good. Uh, and she was covering the legislature and just who rowing everything. And one, but one day at Spanish Village, the only time in her three years at the Observer, or three and a half or four, that I asked for anything critical, I said, Molly, when are you going to get serious? And she said, quick as a whip, she said, when we have a chance to win. <laughs> and it was such a good answer. I didn't uh, retort. I mean, yeah. that, that closed the discussion, when we have a chance to win. Okay. We published, we started the RAG in Austin in 1966. You were, you know, I mean, a, a, an incredible role model, the Texas Observer and the RAG, though we were very different. We were speaking to different audiences. We had different approaches to how to change things. Well, uh, indeed, and I, I, I heard talk from my friends in the RAG community that y'all were going to come down to the Observer and occupy it because we weren't militant enough on a few things. <laughs> but I, I think you lost your guts and you never came down. Well, I didn't know what I was going to do when you arrived and said, Duggar, move out. <laughs> y'all well, never came. Yeah, I know. I don't even you know. You remember that? No, but I do know that we had a, like a radical liberal conference that the, that the, the uh, Observer and the RAG sponsored. And, right. we, and we all got together and talked That's about right. our different approaches. And I think the main difference was that the RAG, the folks at the RAG didn't think that we could work within the system to change things. Mm -hmm. And the difference was... You certainly that, turned out more <laughs> right than I was. Well, I don't know. Times change, things change. and it, That's right. Uh, who knows right now how we can change things. That's right. God knows. Um, I also wanted to read this. Well, I, I've got all these props. Folks, for those of you listening, <laughs> I've got books. Because I flail. My arms flail. So if I can have a book to hold, then that's it. Uh, I, I can flail without books. You don't even need a book. Um, uh, North Toward Home, Willie Morris's yeah. wonderful memoir yeah. of uh, Good Willie. His, his life and times. Um, he wrote that Ronnie Duggar is not only one of the great reporters of our time in America. More than that, he had imbued an entire group of young and inexperienced colleagues with a feel for Texas, for commitment in the most human sense, and for writing. Duggar will be judged not by what he wrote about corruption or how to end corruption, but by the sense of fairness in the way he wrote about corruption. Um, tell me how the Texas Observer came about uh, we were talking before the show and it, about the difference in, well, for one thing, the Democratic Party and in party politics right now, but it came up out of a, out of a thrust from the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. Frankie Randolph, right. who was an amazing character, who was actually the, the initiator, I guess. He was actually the first publisher, although we had a, different, a group who were publishing. Actually, I could talk about it too long because there's too much to talk about, but especially in the present. But uh, essentially... A group, of, I was alienated, I was particularly alienated by McCarthyism at that time, and I was headed for a shrimp boat to go down to Mexico. And one weekend, they, they, the liberals, the, what they're then called National Democrats, they were the people like who would be for Kefauver or somebody for president, I decided they wanted to take over a state, the state observer that Paul Holcomb was running, which was more like an opinion newsletter, and, uh, but good, and start a paper. Well, they asked me to do it, and we met that that uh, weekend, and I told them I would do it, but I would do it only if they gave me total control of the content, exclusive control of the content. I didn't want a party news. It's fine to have a party newspaper, but I wasn't going to work for it, and they agreed. Mark Adams, who became our printer, uh, according to Bob Eckhart, who was in the room when it happened after I had left, said, if ever a rattlesnake rattled before he struck, Duggar rattled. <laughs> <laughs> and Mark denied he ever said it, but I can see why he said it, because I was just You saying, did strike. Yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah. I did. Yeah. And I didn't give a damn whether I took the job or not. I was, right. you know, it, yeah. I was sort of plus or minus. Right. And anyhow, so that's how it started. Yeah. And by the way, every editor that I appointed after that, through 1944, has the same right. So when Rod Davis resigned, saying that, uh, well, a few things, he had that right. And the time came when I asked him a question, he gave me his answer, and I fired him. Mm -hmm. That was the deal. You're free, and I can fire you. That All was right. the deal. That was the deal I had with Frankie Randolph. She, she did <laughs> fire me once. She was mad, I think, because I was for either Maury Maverick or Henry Gonzalez for the Senate race. I don't remember which one I endorsed. She, yeah. They were for the other. And she fired me. To, <laughs> She was drunk, I think, and she called me two hours later and she changed her mind. <laughs> well, that's the way it goes. That's funny. Tell me more about that era, about that time, about how it felt, about what the, well, the observer it, was responding to. You know, it took me a while to more or less realize and acknowledge it, but if you look at Lyndon's presidency, 
I think it's perfectly and objectively true that it was the most progressive domestic policy presidency since Roosevelt. After all, Truman was just following Clark Clifford on national health insurance to get the minorities out and, and get elected. But Johnson really did a whole lot in domestic policy, which is exactly what you'd want the liberal to do. And then, of course, the Vietnam War not only ruined that, but killed two million people in Vietnam. Or I heard McNamara admit to a uh, Vietnamese general on a documentary that three million were killed. I guess he was including the French. So that was, of course, ruinous. And that was the problem with Johnson. And uh, Kennedy came along, though, and he sounded like a lot more moderate man domestically than Johnson, not nearly as liberal. But in fact, in the longer run, I regard Kennedy and Khrushchev as, as two heroes of the human race. They saved us from nuclear war. Of course, Khrushchev knew very well that we were way ahead of them in our nuclear weapons buildup. They knew that we could first strike and they couldn't retaliate strong enough to deter them, deter us. In that case, they put all their weapons, half their weapons, in, in Cuba. In the retrospect, we realized they were loaded to fire. And I just finished Serge Khrushchev's memoir, where he says his father told him that if they had fired their weapons, it would have killed 80 million of us. Well, imagine what we'd have done then to the whole communist orbit. Would have been half the world we'd have wiped out. It was that close. And it was very close. I remember um, LeMay, the, you know, the uh, member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, was sitting there and he told uh, Kennedy to his face, it's in the dialogues, in the transcripts, that what he was doing, that is refusing to bomb and invade at once, which the Joint Chiefs were unanimously for, was worse than what Chamberlain did at, at Munich. Well, you see, you can get me to talking about that and I won't quit. Well, in other words, actually, Khrushchev and Kennedy saved the human race. And I, history will show that in the long run, just like it'll show Truman as a mass murderer in the long run. Hmm. You said that you wrote that when you were, I think you were at the White House and you were talking to, I, I, to Johnson. Johnson about the, the bomb and about Hiroshima. I, I don't remember exactly what the details were, and you said that he was, he said, here, I have to, I'm the one who has to hit this button. Yeah, there's and, a little more to it. I, I mean, it was impermissible, impermissible to ask a president about nuclear weapons. Nobody ever did it, I don't think. But I did ask Truman why we didn't have a no first use policy. As I recall it, he sputtered with anger. I was about 20 or 21. And uh, his face went red, and he didn't answer. So I asked uh, Johnson. I was interviewing him. We were at dinner with two other journalists in the, uh, over in Lafayette Square. I don't remember what I asked him, but you couldn't ask him, would you, push the, would, uh, would you push the button? Would you retaliate? You just couldn't ask that question. I think you would have been thrown out of the White House, like I almost was the press conference with Truman. And I asked him, what am I supposed to what are people like me supposed to say to our citizens out there when you tell us that in the first 30 minutes of a nuclear exchange, 400 million people will die. And uh, he told me a long story, a funny story, which really meant that he hoped, he hoped he'd get through his term without being struck by lightning. And then he told, then he, he got mad at me because of course he and I were adversarial, more or less, and he didn't like me much. Uh, although I don't know why he was letting me in the White House then. And uh, he said, uh, he started, he got into a workup against you liberals. I'm the one who has to know all the facts, and I'm the one, and he put his hand up and then ducked his thumb down in the air. I'm the one who has to mash the button. That's what he said. <laughs> were you afraid thinking, that he would I, accidentally mash it? I've been thinking about that for 40 years. What does yeah. that mean? It yeah. meant that he was, psycholo I think it meant he was psychologically prepared to mash the button. He'd be the one who'd have to do it, and he would have done it. The question is, would we retaliate if we were, if we were struck? If, and the issue there, it's the one hidden in the deterrence theory, is that if we are the victims, we got five or 10 minutes that we know we're gonna be committed mass murder against, we're all gonna die, or 80 million of us are gonna die, would we commit mass murder before it occurred? And the answer is yes, that's what the deterrence doctrine means. That's why the president, in my opinion, no, in my guess, that Johnson meant he was prepared to commit mass murder if somebody was gonna mass murder us. That's where we are now, instead of abolishing the damn thing, the darn at, things. At that time, the, the, the bomb was on everybody's mind. Yeah. I mean, it was, yeah. a, a, children uh, <coughs> would have nightmares. I mean, it was, a, it was a great cause for 
you know, uh, all kinds of mental health problems among young people in this country. I mean, it was a, it was, there was a sense of imminence about it. And they were right. And they were right. Uh, now it's, it's receded as an issue. Uh, how much safer are we? We're worse off. We're worse off. The first uh, the thing about uh, the Cold War, it was predictable. Uh, you could, I mean, I mean, they they knew we were going for for first strike, or we knew, but it nevertheless almost blew up three times. There was the there was the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, which was just by a whisker. Then in 1979, when uh, Brzezinski was uh, National Security Advisor to, to Carter, uh, he he was being told by NORAD that 20,000 Soviet missiles were in the air against us. And he's t uh, testified himself that he was five minutes from calling uh, Carter to say, we're about to be mass murdered. What would Carter have done? And then in the early 80s, we were so strong, and R Reagan was uh, calling up, you know, the evil empire, and that Andropov and the Soviets, according to Khrushchev and other sources, especially Ronald Rhodes' book called The uh, f folly of uh, the folly, uh, the illusion of fo of our armaments. I forget the name of the book. That uh, Andropov was getting ready to hit us first, so we wouldn't hit him first. And then along came Gorbachev. Thank God. No. Gorbachev and Reagan. I, th I think those two. Reagan wanted to disarm. Disarm. Wanted to abandon nuclears. I don't think. I think somebody lied to him at Reykjavik. We don't know who lied to him about about uh, Gorbachev's position. But then, of course, Star Wars became the, the hang-up that kept Reagan from going along with Gorbachev. So that certainly makes Gorbachev one of the three great people in this issue, and, and I, I give Reagan a lot of credit. He just thought his way through it and said, hey, we can't kill all these people. And he was trying to prevent it, but it's still on the table. Now we're getting nine nations, each one with a secret uh, military secrecy policy keeping us from knowing what they're doing. There's a guy named Rosenbaum wrote a book called The End of the Beginning, that uh, recent, and he basically says that the Israelis have five German-made submarines in the Mediterranean armed with nuclear weapons ready to retaliate if Iran strikes them. Who knows when they're going to use them, if they have them? I mean, we don't know. It's much more dangerous than it was in the Cold War. Nice. There are also weapons out there that are unaccounted for, warheads that are unaccounted for, uh, that are pr who knows whose hands they're in. Some of the uh, guys who have woke up, woke, awakened up, and one of those is McNamara before he died, there were five guys saying, we've got to have all of these weapons. And none was working, has been working, and so have we, on trying to uh, keep the terrorists and other such, uh, the commercial guys like who were with Khan in, in uh, Pakistan, from getting the weapons. Okay, that's... That's sort of like uh, deciding to uh, scrub your kitchen uh, surface so you don't get bacterial uh, meningitis or something. But the fact is, we've got to abolish them. Okay. And this has been great. A legend in Texas journalism and in, in Texas progressive uh, I don't know, history. Do I get a choice between being a godfather and a legend? You're a godfather and a legend. <laughs> Both. So declared. Well, I'd rather, I'd rather be alive, and I'm going for 10 more years, so let's try Okay, well, thank you so much for being with us. This has been very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, I'm Thorne Dreyer. This is RAG Radio. Next week, American Botanical Council Director Mark Blumenthal on herbal and alternative medicine. And the week after that, Gay Marriage in America with Gail Leander Wright and Betsy Leander Wright. Um, if you want to get in touch with us, RAG Radio at koop.org. I'm Thorne Dreyer, KOOP, Hornsby, Austin. <laughs>